Hey folks, in the last several episodes of Code Club, we've been looking at a variety of approaches to build climate spirals. Climate spirals are a line plot depicted in polar coordinates where each lap around the spiral represents a different year. And so these were originally made by Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading and quickly became quite iconic. More recently, NASA released a more updated version with newer data from their data set. And, and so we've been building out these different versions based on Ed Hawkins's version as well as the NASA version to build GIFs or MP4s that you could kind of watch the spiral evolve over time. What I wanna do in today's episode though is show you how we can build an interactive version of a climate spiral and we're gonna do it in three dimensions. And so we'll have the polar coordinates, but then we'll also have a Z layer, uh, which will be the time, right? And so you can imagine that climate spiral in 2D, now like a slinky pulling it up and being able to visualize it and kind of dig into it, if you will, using uh, interactivity. So there's two frameworks that I've used in the past to build interactive data visuals. The first is RGL. I find that RGL maybe has a little bit of limitations to it and isn't as easy to use. The second approach is Plotly. Uh, I've talked about Plotly maybe about a year ago. Um, and, and so Plotly is great for building web-based interactive visuals. So you could make a visual, put it into an HTML document like a web page, and then your viewers uh, could play around with it and move the data around. If you're coming from the microbiome world like me, uh, perhaps you could think about making a three-dimensional ordination, or you could have an ordination in two dimensions plus a time component. So I'm not gonna do that, but what we're gonna to do today is to take our climate spiral and bring that into Plotly to make an interactive three-dimensional visualization that I think you'll find is gonna be pretty cool. So before we can plot the data, we need to get the data. If you wanna get the data that I have along with all the code that I'm gonna generate, down below in the description is a link to a blog post that will get you everything you need. I'm gonna go ahead and save this R script into my code directory. I'll call this climate spiral Plotly. And we'll go ahead and add to this library tidyverse. And we're also gonna need library Plotly. Uh, so you might need to install Plotly if you haven't installed that before. Great, so we are going to need to get our data in. And we've done this in previous episodes, but typically I copy and paste over and over again. But I wanna do it from scratch for anybody that's just joining us for the first time. And so we'll do a read CSV uh, data forward slash, and it's this GLB file. Go ahead and run that, and that brings it in as a CSV, um, but why isn't it parsing it? Oh, right, because the first line of this file uh, has a header, and it's just kind of a comment that we don't really need. So we can say skip equals one, and so now this reads in and parses it properly with the year and the 12 months. Very good. And so now what I wanna do is to do a select on the year, uh, and that was a capital Y year, and then I want all of the months. So then I can do month, Dot ABB. And so now I get the year plus the 12 months. Um, I didn't comment on this before, um, but the full version has kind of seasonal ranges. So like, um, and also a, an, uh, an annual average from January to December, December to November, but then like December, January, February, March, April, May, so forth, right? The other thing I noticed when I ran this with the select was that it gives me a warning message that if we use a vector to get specific columns, the best practice is to use all of as a function around the vector of names we want. And so we can go ahead and add that here. So we'll do all underscore of month ABB. And again, what that's doing is telling the select function that we want all of the values in this external vector, in this month.abb vector. And again, if you haven't seen that before, month ABB is a built-in vector that has the names of all those months. And so now when we run this, of course, we get that and we don't get the warning message about using all of. Very good, so now we need to get this to be tidy. So we'll now do pivot longer uh, and we'll do everything but the year and we'll do names two and I'll do month and our values two, I'll say T diff. And so this is a temperature difference. Each month is a difference for that month uh, relative to that month over the years of 1951 to 1980. And so that's why the numbers um, look a little bit weird. They're not the absolute temperatures that you might expect to see. So I'm getting a error message that it can't do this pivot longer because January is a double and April is a character. And that reminds me 
that in the original CSV file, they indicate NA values with three stars. So now if I do NA equals star uh, uh, quotes and then three stars, uh, if we run that, we now see that April is a double. Whereas before when we ran it, let me come way back up here. Yeah, we see that April was a character, right? And so I should have noticed that those months from April out are um, formatted a little bit differently than January, February, March. Anyway, so we should be good to go now. Yeah, and so now it pivoted longer. That also means that there's NA values in our data frame. And I think that that is the last several values. And so if we do slice tail, and let's do N equals 12. Yeah, so basically from April through December of 22, uh, I pulled these data down in March, or I guess in April, and they didn't have the full April data yet. Those are NA values. And so I could replace that slice tail with drop an A. And now if I do uh, slice uh, tail n equals 24, uh, yeah, we no longer have those NA values and everything looks good. So the next thing that I want to be thinking about is that my month is of type character and I'd rather it be a type of factor. And that's because the month, um, the alphabetical is not their order, right? It's January through December. And so I can then do a mutate on month to be a factor of the month column. And I can say levels equals month.abb. And so now when I run this, I see that this column month is now a factor. If I hadn't done that, then it would order my months alphabetically. Now it's going to order my months chronologically as the order of month ABB. Excellent. I'll go ahead and for good measure do an, a sorting. I'll do arrange year and month. I don't think that's going to change anything. I realize that I have a lowercase year when it's an uppercase up here. I'm going to go ahead and change that. So I can, in the select, I can say lowercase year equals uppercase year. And so then I need to change that capital Y to lowercase all the way throughout. I prefer to work in lowercase because that way I don't have to worry about if this variable capitalized or lowercase. It just, it's always lowercase, right? And so now we've got those data sorted appropriately and we're in good shape. Now what we need to do is build out our X, Y, and Z coordinates. And so we'll do another mutate. We need X, Y, and Z, right? And so to get X, Y, and Z, I first want to think in terms of polar coordinates, in terms of the angle, theta, as well as the radius. So my radius, I'm going to think of that as being my T diff uh, column. And then my theta, uh, we saw this before, but we can think of that as being basically the month number uh, divided by, tw by 12 times 2 pi. And that'll give us the radians position in that um, polar coordinates. And if, if this is novel to you, go watch the last episode where I talked about building out uh, one of these climate spirals without using cord polar. That describes all the trigonometry. Okay, so to get that, I wanna also have the month number. And to get the month number, what we can then do is as.numeric on month. Uh, and let me just double check that that works the way I anticipate it working. And so, yeah, so now we see we've got the month number uh, for each of the months, right? So like September is number nine. That's great. Okay, so I can then put a comma here, radius T diff, theta then is going to be month uh, number minus one because I want January to be at a zero position. Uh, and then that divided by 12, but I want that all times two times pi. Uh, pi is a built-in uh, constant in R, which gives us 3.14, whatever, right? And so now what we get is our month number, our radius, and the theta. So now what we need to do is to convert our radius and our theta into x and y. So our x, we can say radius times the sine of theta, and our y is the radius times the cosine of theta, and then our z is going to be the year. So now we have all this wonderful information that we can then use to make a plot. So let's go ahead and save this as t underscore data. And as we saw before, we could take like t data, pipe that to ggplot, aes, x equals x, y equals y, um, and then do uh, color equals year, or z say, and then we can do geom path, and that gets us our climate spiral. One thing I'm remembering from the last episode, however, is that our radius for T diff is gonna be negative, right? So again, if I look at T data and look at my T diffs, I've got negative values in there. And so that does funky things of giving us a negative radius like we see here. 
And so what we did in the last episode was added a constant to all of the radius values. So let's go ahead and do uh, plus 1.5. And so now we can see that, that hole, if you will, inside of the donut. Okay, we've done this already, but what we wanna do now is to make an interactive version of this where the year is in the Z axis. So what we'll do now is go over and learn a little bit about Plotly. If you go to plotly.com, it brings you to this website. Um, Plotly is a, um, a JavaScript HTML based tool that allows you to make interactive visualizations that are web-based. Uh, so if you go to docs and then go to graphic libraries docs, you'll see that there's a variety of tools available for interacting with Plotly. There's Python, there's R, Julia, JavaScript, uh, there's a Plotly ggplot2 um, graphic library, there's F Sharp, which I'd never heard of before, MATLAB, and then something called Dash. What I'm gonna be interested in is mainly uh, this Plotly R open source graphing library. There's also a ggplot2 add-on, which basically allows you to take a ggplot-based visual and feed that directly into Plotly to make an interactive tool that way. I find that that's a little bit limited for what we want to do within three dimensions. So I'm going to work within uh, the, the R-based open source library, which will allow us to build a figure directly within Plotly. And so going into that page, we find that they've got a really great source of uh, visuals that I kind of scan through and I find something that looks like what I want to do. And then I see how they did it in that visual. So again, uh, there's fundamentals, kind of the basics of using Plotly, some basic two-dimensional charts, statistical charts, variety of scientific charts, uh, financial charts, maps, artificial intelligence, ah, 3D charts, that's what I'm interested in. Uh, but we'll also see there's subplots, ways to make facets, transformations, various controls, some animations, um, and a variety of other things, right? So what, again, we're interested in are 3D charts, and specifically, I'm interested in 3D line plots. And so, again, my approach when I'm learning something new is to look for visuals that look like what I want to do, but in that new framework. So in this case, Plotly, right? And so 3D line plots looks a lot like what I want. So let's go ahead and click on that. This opens the 3D line plots in our page, and we can kind of look through here and see um, you know, basic 3D line plot. And so one of the things that you might notice is that I can click on the plotting window and spin this around, right? I can use my scroller on my mouse to zoom in and to zoom out, right? And so there's a tooltip so that if I hover on a different point, I get a bubble that pops up with the X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? And I can make line plots like this. And so this then would be the code to make a very basic line plot like you see here. So let's go down. Um, so we can make a 3D line and markers plot. Hey, this looks a lot like what we're doing, right? Uh, this is in polar coordinates. We can see uh, that they've got X and Y and Z like we do, right? Um, so again, I, I didn't intend this, but it's, it's pretty cool to see something like a climate spiral here. One thing that they're adding to this is that they've got, if we scan in, uh, they've got markers on the different uh, points of our line plot, which isn't what I totally want. Um, also, this has... Uh, a color scale that's coming from the Veritas package, which we saw a while back when we were looking at the Ed Hawkins version. I'd prefer to use the blue to white to red color scale that we saw with the NASA project. Ah, look, <laughs> it's almost like we asked for it. Custom color scale, and once you know it, it's also in polar coordinates, right? And so they've got this kind of cool spirally thing that's got a custom color scheme. Perfect, right? This is exactly what we want. What I'm gonna do is I will go ahead and copy this into a new R script here in R Studio, and I'm gonna go ahead and run these different lines. And so as I'm running this code, I don't wanna just copy and paste the code. I wanna think about what is the code doing, right? And so, um, so we load the Plotly library. There's something here about a count of 3,000. So maybe this is that there's gonna be like 3,000 different points being represented. They then create X, Y, Z, and C as vectors, but they're empty vectors. They then use a for loop to go through all 3,000 values of count. R then is the radius, which is the count, or I, the counter, the stepper uh, variable, times the count minus one. So again, that's gonna be the radius. The X and Y then are 
Um, yeah, so it's basically the same transformation that we saw before. Uh, they're using C, X, comma, and then the trigonometry that we've seen. And what that does is that basically concatenates on a new value to all the previous values of X, Y, Z, and C. I'm not sure what the C is. Uh, maybe it's color. Um, and so then they make a data frame from those four vectors, and then they throw it in and make a plot. And so, again, looking at the syntax for this plot, we can see that the syntax is a bit different than what we're used to, right? So they give Plotly the data, the data frame, right? So in our case, that would be like the T data. They then define X, Y, and Z, and they're using this tilde X, I think to say the column X within data should get mapped to X, the Y column in data should get mapped to Y, Z to Z, right? And that it's then using a type scatter plot, a 3D scatter plot, and the mode lines. Then there's some styling here that we can add for the line, right? And so uh, the width being four, the color is getting uh, mapped by the C column from the data data frame. And then again, remember this section of the web page was for a custom color scale. And so what we can see then is that we've got this color scale argument going to this list to define the line. So when C is zero, it should be this color in hexadecimal. When it's one, it should be this color. So I think I have a handle of what it's doing. Let me just run all this and make sure it works uh, like we saw on the web page. And sure enough, here is the visual that we had um, up on the web page. So again, what I wanna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and copy this code that they used to build the figure into my climate spiral. I'll go ahead and comment out the ggplot and I'll paste that in. Maybe I'll remove the fig because I, I don't know that I definitely necessarily need all that and we'll tab this over a little bit to make it look nicer. And so again, in our data, that's gonna be T underscore data. We have then X, Y, and Z. Um, again, type uh, scatter 3D lines. And then we need, um, we're gonna, let's leave it with the four. And then my color, I'm gonna make that T diff. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. Of course, we'll have to adjust along the way. Very cool, there is our climate spiral. Um, and you can see again that we can pan around, spin it around, play with it, um, and it's pretty cool. And we can zoom in and we can kind of look, click on different lines and see what the temperature diff was for uh, those different positions. Very cool. All right, so I'm not such a fan of this color scheme. And so what I wanna think about is how can we adjust this color scale to get the color scheme we want? And so let's go ahead and mess with the zero and one. Um, I'm getting the sense that zero to one is a scale. So it's basically transforming T diff to be a number between zero and one. So let's go ahead and make our zero the lowest level. Um, I wanna make that blue. So in hexadecimal, it, it's two characters for red, two for green, two for blue. So we'll do zero, 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 FF. And then for red, of course, will be FF0000, because again, red, green, blue. Fantastic. We now have our blue to red. Of course, I want that to go through uh, zero uh, at 0.5. So let me go ahead and now see if we can modify this. And so I'll do 0 0.5. And for that, that's going to be white. So it's going to be all F. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's see what happens when we do that. So very cool. We now see that goes from blue out to red. Uh, and I'm pretty happy with the way that that all works. And, and it's looking pretty well. Uh, and it's amazingly simple to have gotten this far. The next thing that I wanna do is go ahead and change the tooltip, right? So I don't care so much about the X, Y, or the Z um, being shown. What I'd rather have would be to have the month, the year, and then the temperature difference. And so we can modify the, the appearance of that tooltip and what information is being portrayed. To do that, let's go back to the Plotly and see if we can figure it out from one of the demos that they have. So let's go back to the gallery of different options. And across the top here, I remember the first was fundamentals. So let's look at the different options or things that they have available for looking at fundamentals. Ah, and we can see that there's all sorts of different ways to change the marking and styling of what's going on. There's one here called hover text and formatting. So let's check that out. So again, we're in this hover text and formatting in our page, and so if I hover over each of these points, I see I get a different label. So typically what we got before would be like the X, Y coordinates. And so what we're seeing here is that when I cover this point here, I get text D. So then coming up here, I notice two things. So that there is a line in here for text, 
as well as for hover info. And so text then is the text that shows up. And so I imagine that could be a vector of values. And then hover info is text, which I think is telling Plotly that the hover info should come from the text column. So again, we'll do text equals, and I'll do t diff, and we'll modify this later to make it look better. And then we'll do hover info equals uh, text. So now returning to our climate spiral, we see that when we highlight over a different point, we get, yeah, we, we get the, the t diff for that particular value. Cool. So now I'd like to make it look a little bit nicer. So what we'll do is create another variable in our data frame that will be the label. And so I'll do label equals glue. And so I'm going to use the glue function, which comes to us from the glue package. So I need to do library glue. And again, what I want is the month and the year and then the temperature difference. And so I'll do um, month and a space uh, and then year. And then I'll do a backslash n. Uh, and it occurs to me I need this all to be in quotes. And then I'll put in here uh, t diff. And so now if we look at t data, we get a column that's got our our month, year, and at least on my zoomed in version, it gets um, trimmed off. So then we'll change our text to be label. And so now what we see is that we have the month, the year, and the temperature difference. So that's pretty cool, right? So I can then scroll in here and grab a point, uh, any point, and I see that I've got blue at negative 0.03. So something that has me a little bit worried is that, um, here I have a positive value. So July 1983 has a TDIF 0.18. That should be red, not blue. <laughs> um, and so again, if I kind of look through these different values, 0.1 is, is kind of large for the, the values we're looking at here, the range we're looking at, and it's still blue when that should be red, right? So my concern is that it's scaling all of the values to between zero and one with the midpoint at 0.5 being white. I think what we need to do though is tell it what t diff value needs to be at 0.5. So let's come back to fundamentals and see if there's anything that sticks out to us about modifying the color. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, I thought I saw something. So built-in color scales. Let's look at that and maybe let's look at discrete colors. So the built-in color scales, they've got things from Color Brewer that allow us to put in specific color palettes. Um, you know, maybe the divergent would work for us, but still we need a way to tell it what's at that midpoint. So I'm not seeing anything here. If we look at discrete colors, um, yeah, so this is like setting specific values um, for different variables. And that's not really what I want either. So I think we're gonna to have to turn to our friend Google. So I think what I'll do is I'll search for Plotly color scale. Uh, that's the name of the argument that we're modifying in the list to set that color range. And let's do midpoint. And so this first link is for a Python version, uh, but let's check that out because maybe that will be useful in the long run. So again, continuous scales, uh, of course it is Python, but maybe it'll translate over to R. Um, and so as I look down here, I see color ranges. And as I read through this minimum to maximum range of data mapped to the zero to one input range, again, in our color scales argument, we had blue being zero, red being one. Um, kind of reading through this a little bit more, I see C min, C mid, C max um, for the various arguments for things like uh, color axis C min, so forth, right? So this C mid is intriguing to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and search for C mid. So here they've got C min within the marker um, next to the values. Um, and so I think that could be it. So next to the color scale, perhaps, or next to the color and the color scale, what we could do would be to do C mid equals zero. Let's see if that works. And so now that looks a little bit different, right? And so if we look at 0 0.5, that's now a reddish color rather than a bluish color. Um, and negative 0.15 is a bluish color, right? So I think we were successful in that 0.2 is a little bit red, pinkish, but it's still pretty white. So I think that C mid was what we needed to associate 0.5 with um, a specific value from T diff. And again, um, 
it's a bit of troubleshooting and kind of searching for something that looks like what we want, getting the right Google terms. In this case, we were taking an example from Python and bring it over to R. I don't really know Python, but um, the Plotly library in general is consistent across these different languages. The language like Python or R is the interface to the Plotly library. And so I think a lot of the documentation will be similar-ish, <laughs> right, um, in a relative context. I don't think it's gonna change anything necessarily, but I could also go ahead and put in my C min and C max. Um, and so my C min is going to be T data, it's gonna be the minimum of uh, T data, dollar sign T diff, yep. And C max then will be the max of that, right? So max on that. And like I said, I don't think that really changed much of anything. Finally, what I wanna do is go ahead and remove the X and Y coordinates. So back in the fundamentals page on Plotly, there is a special button for axes. So the first thing we see um, is that this tutorial explains how to set the properties of a two-dimensional Cartesian axes, namely, namely X and Y. Other kinds of subplots and axes are described in others. Um, so for 3D axes, the axis object is seen. So let's go to 3D axes. And so then this is how to format the axes of 3D plots in R with Plotly. Wonderful. And so again, what we have is that we would add to their figure a layout, right? Where we have scene equals list, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. Um, just kind of looking through here for examples where perhaps they've removed or changed the axis values or labels. So let's start with removing the title. And so I think what I'll do is axx, um, and Y and Z. So let's go ahead and copy this down and I'll put that right up here above the Plotly. And so my title for X will be nothing, for Y will be nothing, and Z, I'm gonna go ahead and remove that also because I think if I leave in the year, that'll be pretty obvious. And so let's go ahead and run all that. So what we saw down here is that we need the scene uh, layout. So I'll copy that and then I'll put that at the end of my Plotly and put that on another line. So I now see that my X and Y axis titles are gone. Uh, let's go ahead and put these on separate lines so it's easier to see what's going on. So as I look down through here, I see information about changing the grid color, uh, changing the range or types of values on the axes, but not exactly what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking to remove the grid line as well as the tick labels. So I'll come in here and do Plotly, Remove grid lines, R. How to horizontal grid lines in Plotly R. So let's, uh, oh, down here, axes. I think this takes us back to the page that we were at before. So let's look for grid lines through here. Um, so toggling axis grid lines. Let's go to that. So again, this is the 2D page, not the 3D page, but maybe it'll work anyway. So there's an argument here of show grid equals false. So let's come back up here to, to our x, 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 and we'll do show grid equals false. Uh, and let's put that in for our y as well. Ah, and so we've gotten rid of those grid lines. There's still a zero line in here. Coming back to this page, I noticed that there's also toggling axis zero lines. The next thing down, so that's zero line equals false. And then way back up here, We'll go ahead and add that as an argument uh, for our zero line. So that zero line is gone. Um, I do like having the grid lines there for the years because again, it's easy when it's on an angle to kind of see where the line is. Uh, we do have those labels on the axes that I'm not a fan of. There's also toggling axis labels I see here. Uh, axis tick marks can be disabled by setting the show ticks axis property to false. So let's try that. So we'll come back up here, uh, show tick labels equals false, and we'll do false here. Great, so let's give this a shot. We've lost the X and Y axis ticks, and that looks pretty good. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Great, so the next thing I wanna do is save this to an HTML page so that I can look at it and perhaps put it up on a web page, uh, including the blog post. Again, if you go down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post, I'll put the HTML version of this interactive over on the blog post so you can play around with it and see what it looks like. So to save this, I need to assign the plot object to a variable. I'll call that P. So the function that we want comes from a package called HTML widgets. So I can go ahead and do library HTML widgets. 
make sure I've got that loaded. And then we'll do save widget. And we give it the widget, so the, the plot that we want, P, as well as the file name. So I'm gonna put that in quotes, I'm gonna put it in figures, and we will then do climate spiral uh, plotly.html. So there we go. Uh, those lines are a bit thin. I would like them to be maybe a bit thicker so it's kind of easier to see what's going on. If we came back to our code, you'll notice that we had width equals four here. Let's go ahead and put that up to 10, make it a bit thicker. So that looks a lot thicker and more robust. One thing I'm noticing, however, is that we seem somewhere have to lost the zeroing of our data at white. So here at April 1973, we've got 0.27. Um, that, that should be a reddish color. So I think what I'm gonna do is come back in here and seem, I know things were working before we added the C min and C max. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. And there's our April 1973 as that reddish color. So that looks good. One final thing I'm gonna do because I can't help myself is to add the degree sign. So we'll come back up here before we call it a day. Um, and here where we've got our T diff, we'll go ahead and add the Unicode, uh, which is the U 00 B zero and then a C for degree Celsius. And there we go. <laughs> we now have our nicely labeled um, interactive plot. And again, I think this is really cool. This is basically what we had been making in the static version. But again, the ability to zoom in and put your cursor on different points to spin it to look at what's going on. I think it's just really powerful and really attractive. Of course, this only works in an HTML based environment, like on a browser. Uh, this won't obviously work on a PDF. So if you're in science like me, um, you know, we can dream of the day when we can have interactive visuals on uh, for our papers, right? Um, but we're still stuck in this mode of thinking about a physical paper, a physical PDF, so to speak. Um, rather than using the interactivity that comes with, you know, working with the internet. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting as another way to visualize these data. Again, with the GIF or an MP4, as the creator, we're giving the view to our audience, although there is that animation. Here, we allow our audience to interact with the visual, which I think is just really powerful. Um, and I think this is a really cool instance for three dimensions, where we can put that time um, in, through the years on that Z dimension. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. Please share this with your friends and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.